Hi, I'm Hazel. It's Saturday again, which makes it time to sit down and catch up on the wow news of the week, what I've been up to, and answer some of your questions. This week, the Twisting Corridors mode of Torghast opened. This is the cosmetics only mode. There is no Soul Ash, so if you're only in it for legendaries, you can safely skip this one and probably count yourself lucky, because if you don't like Torghast and you're not already in the mood to do more of it, then 144 floors is not the thing for you. There are eight layers, but 16 floors per layer with this one. 18 floors per layer. One of those two numbers is correct. I am fried. Thankfully, the rewards are cosmetic only, although that has not stopped me from doing it. For layer two, you're going to get a Death Seeker pet. For layer four, you get this toy that turns you into a Mossworn for 10 minutes. For layer six, you get the Spire Stalker Your Name title. And then if you can complete layer eight, you get the Corridor Creeper mount, which is one of two mounts in this game that are usable in the Maw. Um, surveying this gave me a little bit of a pause to think because the only reason that I've been doing the Maw, to the minor extent that I've been doing it, the only reason I've been considering doing the Maw was to get my Venari up so I could unlock permanent Torghast upgrades. And now that I have my Legendary and I can pretty easily clear um, layer 8s of the regular Torghast anyways, the only reason that I really want those Torghast permanent upgrades from Venari in the first place are to get <laughs> to the end of Twisting Corridors so I can get the Maw mount, so I can do Venari daily, so I can get rep for upgrades for, like, it's very circular. Um, I suppose that it is still good to have all those upgrades unlocked because the Torghast upgrades on Venari are account-wide, so they will apply to your alts, so when I get on an alt and I need to get a legendary for them, it will help me to have those unlocked, and also, you know, they can have the mom out for their dailies. But um, right now, it's I'm, I'm kind of looking and being like, well, do I want to try to push to the end of Twisting Quarters so I can have the mom mount while I'm grinding out those upgrades, or do I want to try and grind out those upgrades to make it easier to get to the end of Twisting Quarters? Um, either way, I've been having a swell time. It is taking me, however, a long time to get through a layer. I hear about people doing it in like 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. Um, if that is not your life and you're in there for longer, I am with you. It takes me two and a half hours to get through a layer of Twisting Corridors Torghast as a solo holy priest. And I know it would be faster if I went with a group, but where's the fun in that? I mean, it's probably a great time, but I'm really, really enjoying pushing it solo. I am allowing myself to do one layer of Twisting Corridors in a given day because the last time I tried to chain a few back to back, I ended up staying up until one in the morning and then I made a bad joke about crackers and laughed at my own bad joke about crackers so hard that I started to cry and realized I needed to go to bed. Now, the first layer of Twisting Corridors is required in order to complete the Bolvar story, or at least progress it. I'm unclear on whether there's more. There's always more. Uh, you do need to get to the end of the first layer. If you are having difficulty with that, I can suggest that you set aside a lot of time and skip nothing, and then failing that, check out a guide for your particular class and spec, and failing that, get a group. It seems like some classes are still wildly more capable in Torghast than others, kind of depending on how many benefits you have. Like, if you look at the pool of things that make Torghast easier, and you've got, like, self-heals, interrupts, purges, um, and then, like, you know, good damage powers. Some people will have a few of those things. Bloodlust is another good one. Some people will have all of those things. And if you are a class that has, like, none of those things, then you're going to need to, um, to either try very hard and look up a guide and figure out what, like, the good build is and hope for it. Or, you know, you can run with somebody else that has more of those things to kind of cover your weaknesses so that you don't get just, like, shut out by a particular mob or boss type. For me personally, as an item level 208 now Holy Priest, I am done 4 of 8, and I think I can maybe push it the rest of the way. I'm going to have to find out over the course of next week because each layer takes me two and a half hours. Other news this week, there was a change to Blizzard's policy on in-game advertising, and this came up in kind of an odd way. Usually they'll, like, you know, make a, make a blue post or, you know, update a page on their website, but this time we heard about it through the policy being actioned before anybody knew about it. So what happened? The story floated up on Reddit and then was reported on by Wowhead this week. Gormor, who is a leader of a gold-boosting community, had messaged a GM to try to get a silence overturned. Um, the GM reviewed the situation and decided the silence was not correct, so they overturned the silence, but then applied a ban because they found that the account was created solely for the purpose of advertising, and a brand new changed policy has made that not okay. So they lifted the silence, but then they banned the account um, with no additional warnings whatsoever. Gormor tried to appeal, the account's ban was upheld, that language was then added later to the in-game advertising policy, and that's where we stand now. 
So before we talk any further about this, I know we all have a lot of feelings about gold boosting and we'll talk, we'll get to those. But for now, we're just going to put our gold boosting feelings in like a nice little box and set it off to the side for a second. It is wild to me that this policy change that had not been, to my knowledge anyways, maybe I've missed something, but to my knowledge, it had not been announced, tweeted, posted, or made public in any way whatsoever, just started getting enforced out of nowhere. To be clear, this is within Blizzard's rights. They can do anything they want with their game at any time. They can ban you for any reason they want to. But usually they tend to make it clear before you do a thing that you're not supposed to do the thing. At the time of Garmor's ban, this rule was not public information. Uh, to be very clear, I am on board with the new rule and I think that reducing advertising in the game is a fantastic thing, but it would have been nice if the rule had been posted before it started getting enforced. And then another thing that probably shouldn't have surprised me but did was how many people in the comments of this Reddit thread and this Wowhead post were wildly in favor of this ban, siding with Blizzard just because this action was taken against something that they don't like. I think that if this had been directed towards an activity or a player that was like better liked, the people would have been like forming the mob and burning down metaphorical villages and saying you can't just start banning people for rules that we haven't told any about yet. But because this was against advertising of gold boosting, which is something that is wildly unpopular with people that don't do it. Uh, we're cool and we're on board with this now. I mean, not we, there's no collective we as much as the hive mind tends to get going. Everybody has an opinion and they're not all the same, shocking. But that was just kind of insane. I don't anticipate this kind of situation happening again just because it's really not in Blizzard's best interest to start blindsiding people, especially if they ever hit a target that incites more outrage. But um, it seems that Garmore's out of luck. So. That's what happened. I want to take a second to unpack some of those feelings about gold boosting because those really got dragged into this conversation online. Uh, for the clarification and the record, gold boosting is not real money boosting, but the practice of exchanging gold for a carry in raid, arena, mythic plus for the intent of gaining either gear or achievements or both. A popular and, in my opinion, pretty solid argument against gold boosting is that advertisement for them can easily overwhelm trade chats and make it difficult to use that channel for any actual trading. I'm kind of curious how much actual trading happens on trade chat as opposed to just like on the auction house or through group finder or something anymore. But regardless, that's one argument and a couple of solutions that I've seen thrown around for the advertising problem. Uh, one, some people just want you to ban gold boosting and I am not even though I'm not personally a huge fan of the concept of gold boosting, um, because like in conjunction with the WoW token, it does make the game kind of pay to play. Like technically, you could just dump hundreds of dollars on WoW tokens, get a bunch of gold, spend that gold on boosts, and bada bing bada boom, you have your raid year and or, you know, mythic keys or whatever it is that you want it done. I think gold boosting also makes some new players kind of nervous about the concept of doing content themselves because like, you know, if you're brand new to the game and you step in and you see that people are willing to pay really large amounts of gold just to get a 10 key done, what chance does the new player appear to have of getting that done for free? I think that normalizing and publicizing gold boosts is kind of bad for new people getting into doing content because it makes it seem like if you don't have any friends and you've never, you're not like in the, in the click of people that sell these kind of boosts that you're never going to get it done without paying somebody to drag you through. Thirdly, I think gold boosts are odd just because it seems strange to me to pay a bunch of gold to skip past playing the game yourself um, to get the in-game stuff. Like for me, gaming is a very core loop of you want something and then you do the work and or get the skill and or whatever like the gaming part is to get there and then you get the thing. And those two combined, the reward and the path you took to get there, kind of kind of make the satisfaction of gaming for me. So when you cut out the middle part, it feels like you're getting paid in Monopoly money to me. It feels like what point is an achievement that you didn't really earn? I suppose you could argue that it's for getting into pugs, but um, you know, <laughs> pugs may not, you know, if they're looking for achievements. They are probably not looking for people that bought them and whether or not they can tell, they may be disappointed when they actually get you in there. It's hard to say. It's just a strange kind of market of the game that I don't personally really like, so I personally choose to not participate in it, but that doesn't mean I think nobody else should be able to do it, especially because there's nothing like technically wrong with it as long as we're not trading money around. And even if you did decide to completely ban gold boosting, it would be almost impossible to enforce. 
So for the sake of this conversation, if we accept that gold boosting is not going anywhere, then the second possible solution to the advertising problem would be creating a dedicated tab or interface for boost advertisers to get them out of trade chat and like into their own tab. I've talked about this idea before and it comes down to I don't like it because A, it sort of legitimizes gold boost, which I should remind people are something that is not guaranteed by Blizzard. If somebody says they're going to boost you and you pay them a bunch of gold and they don't boost you, Blizzard is not necessarily going to get you your gold back. If they became part of the official interface, people might assume that they are a safe and trustworthy thing to do, and that's not always going to be the case. I highly doubt that Blizzard is looking to get into the exciting industry of mediating gold boost disputes and tracking down fraud, so it would be a weird thing for them to do to direct people towards a place for them people to get these services in-game if they're not guaranteed by Blizzard. Third possible solution to the advertising thing would be to ban advertising and boosting services in-game altogether, not the services themselves, but any advertising of them. Ban all of it, and then people can go to third-party websites for that. And I think this is the solution that I think is the most likely, um, and I do like it better than leaving things the way they are now. Although, honestly, advertising doesn't bother me because I'm like not in trade chat. The first thing I do in a new character is I get out of trade, I get out of general, I get out of local defense if the locals need my help. That's a shame. But yeah, if you make people go off platform to find their boosting services, it makes the whole thing a little bit more opt in than opt out. Um, people are already going to third party websites for, you know, their class guides, their news, their wowhead, their MMO champion, their icy veins. A million things are routinely done online outside of the in game client. And I don't see any reason why gold boosting advertising should be any different especially if it's kind of causing problems and souring the mood in-game. So to sum up this whole section, I don't personally like gold boosting. I think other people should be allowed to do it if they want. I don't think advertising of it should be in the game at all, if you ask me. And I don't think they should start banning people for things that they haven't told them are bannable offenses just yet. And in my life this week, I finally got my first alt to level 60. I now officially have two characters at level 60. I got my Rustro Druid up and I have started to PvP on her just like an itty teeny little, little, little bit. bit. I find it pretty fun so far, very fast paced. I need to get a little bit more gear still, but there's lots and lots of keybinds to wrangle. Um, I just need to dump more time into it. And it's hard to find time for PVP when my Torghast runs take me two and a half hours each. And questions for this week, Searcher wants to know, is there any form of bad luck protection with Shadowlands world bosses? I've done all four of them and not one piece of loot apart from a legendary memory. Uh, no, sorry. As far as I know, they have never done bad luck protection for your standard loot drops of like mounts and pets and gear. And the closest thing to bad luck protection for gear was Legion legendaries. Um, these days it is mostly for quest items and certainly not for armor from like a world boss or a regular boss or a mythic plus cash. Uh, no bad luck protection there at all. If, if you get unlucky, then you, then you get unlucky and that's kind of rough. Um, some of those disparities, like you might end up in a raid where one player just got like kitted out because they just got really lucky and got a bunch of loot from the bosses they needed and somebody else doesn't have anything because they're just not getting that same kind of luck. And in a raid environment or in like a group environment, you'll have people that don't need the gear because they keep getting all of it, trading it to the people that need it. But definitely for single player content like world bosses, I guess it's not technically single player, but effectively single player content like world bosses, you can just end up getting real unlucky because nobody's necessarily going to start handing out their loot to people that actually need it. Sarah wants to know, what's the next mount that you're going to commit to like midnight? Congrats on that one. Why, thank you. So I am heading all of my alts, or at least a good number of them, out to Mechagon to start working on the Rust Feather mount followed by the Arachnoid Harvester mount. I never got either of those during BFA. I would prefer, I would have preferred to start doing Legion raids just because I kind of like running instanced mount runs. It feels a little bit more determined than waiting for a spawn, even if it does take longer than the 20 minutes or whatever that it takes Rust Feather, Rust Feather to spawn. But the, it still remains that uh, Legion raids are too tough for me and my army of really messy, poorly set up alts uh, to conquer just yet. So until Legion raids become more achievable for me to do while paying 2% attention, I will be parking on Mechagon and hoping to get lucky with Rust Feather. And Sundra wants to know, Hazel, have you heard anything else about unlocking flight since the last time you mentioned it? Now, so far, the only things I know are that flight unlock will be tied to Renown, um, we found out from the interview, and then it's coming in the first major patch of Shadowlands. That's all we got. I imagine that we're not wildly far away from like the earliest hints of news whispers about the first major content patch, but I have not heard anything yet. 
And that has been my week. Thank you very much for watching. If you have a question that you would like me to answer on a news video, please leave it in the comments. Include the word question. I'd like to do a quick plug for Adventures Coffee Company, who I have partnered with to offer you a 10% discount code. They have nerdy themed coffee. They're a small business and they make delicious coffee. I like it very much. The Ragnarost is my favorite. You can save 10% by using the code Hazelnutty at checkout. Thank you all for watching. Stop by my Twitch if you happen to like streams. I've been working through the twisting corridors lately. Uh, appreciate you all and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day.